Welcome back to our series on cloud native application development. I'm Jamie Lan, a senior consultant for application development at Red Hat. On this video, we're going to explore templating for OpenAPI Generator. Previously, we created an OpenAPI specification and created a Spring Boot application based on that specification using OpenAPI Generator. Currently, our application is just stubbing out data returned by our endpoints. In this video, we're going to add some persistence using Spring Data, a Spring framework for data access, and H2, an in-memory database useful for initial development efforts. We're also going to modify our generated POJOs to act as our data objects. This is gonna require a couple new JPA annotations to our POJOs, and we're gonna do that through templating. Since this demo's main focus is on templating, I completed most of the Spring data piece before the video. But let's run through some of the changes that I made. The first change I made was adding two new dependencies to our palm.xml. This is the Spring data dependency and our H2 in-memory database dependency. I also added some properties to point to our new in-memory database. A couple quick notes here. We have this H2 console. It's totally optional, but it gives you uh, a web base IDE that you can use to look at your database. And this will just be part of your Spring Boot application. Also, our database is in memory so that it, if you make any changes to the database and you reboot the Spring application, you're gonna lose any of those changes. You want a slightly more persistent database, you can actually save your database to a file just by going file, colon, and then a location to a file, temp data to do. So this would save it to your temp data to do file. But for our purposes, we're just gonna stick within memory. We also added this data SQL inside of the resources. Uh, Spring is able just to see that this file exists and what it does is it's going to run these SQL statements on your database as soon as it's up. And so what we're doing here is we're just going to create our to-do um, table and this matches what's in our schema and then we're going to insert just a couple values to get us started. We also added this to-do repository here. Uh, this is part of the Spring Data and it's a, just, just a normal JPA repository. Um, if you're not familiar with that, JPA repository uh, has a lot of things that you would expect when you wanna access your data. It's got find all, which returns everything in a table, saves, um, find by IDs, deletes, that sort of thing. The only new method that we needed to add is this get by completed. Uh, one thing that's pretty cool about JPA repositories is it can create the query based on the method name. So you'll notice there's no implementation of this um, interface and there's no at query annotation up here. We just have this method called get by completed and the repository knows that we want to create a query that basically says return any to do items where the completed equals either true or false depending on what you put in here. The next thing that we change is inside of our todo.yaml. And here we added this new ID field. Uh, this is just gonna be our database ID. So the next thing that you may have noticed is our open API to springboot.java up here. Um, if you remember before, this actually used to be one of our generated files, and now we have moved it to our Java source folder. So we have taken control over that. So the first note I'm gonna make is because it's no longer a generated file, the first thing that we did was we added it to our .openapi generator ignore, as you can see here. So make sure to do that for anything that you move into your Java source folder. Uh, and then we had to do this just to add into our component scan our new repository package here so that Spring would be able to find it. And in fact, now that we've taken control over this guy, let's rename him to to-do application something a little bit more appropriate. Now, the last thing that we change is the to-do API controller. Now, we stubbed out most of our methods here and connected it to our to-do repository, but I did leave one method that we can work on um, together. 
And I did this because I did forget a pretty important point in the previous video. So let's let's stub out our final method here. And that's just going to be our get to do based on ID. So here we're just going to return our response entity dot okay because we want a 200 based on our spec. And we are going to use our to do repository to find by ID, insert our to do ID. Um, this actually returns an optional. So we'll just do or else throw, which just says either return the object that is in the repository or in the database, or we're going to throw an exception and we'll throw a new um, response status exception, which actually lets us specify an HTTP code, which is pretty cool because we can just do HTTP status here and do not found, which is what we would expect based on our specification. Uh, if we can't find the object in the database, then we can just return that. So we're either going to return the object with a 200 or we're going to throw a 404 here. And uh, this is a supplier, so this just needs to be a Lambda. Now, the piece that I forgot from the previous video that's pretty important, and you'll notice it down here, is that um, parameter annotations inside of methods aren't actually inherited uh, from interfaces. So we actually were, are going to need to copy those over. So we're going to need to go and set into the to-do API here we're going to need to go to our get method here, so our get to do, and we're going to need to copy all of these annotations over. Now note, uh, the method level annotations and the class level annotations, that's all inherited fine. You don't need to worry about those. It's just these parameter level annotations that you have to worry about. So let's go back to our controller. We'll paste in those annotations, and we should be good to go. You can see I did that for the rest of these guys as well. Now those are all the changes I've made in order to support the new persistence, but if we actually try and run this and do a Maven Spring Boot run, we're gonna run into an issue. So you can see here we get this not manage type and then it's the, our com red hat to do model to do. Let's take a quick look at that. So the reason for that is because in order for to do to be managed by spring, it needs this at entity annotation here. And then also while we're here, we need to add the at ID annotation to our database ID. And then we also need to add an at generated value annotation. And we're gonna want the strategy for that to just be generated type dot identity. So we're gonna to wanna to add all these annotations um, in order to make our persistence work correctly. Now, to do is inside of our generated folder. So the next time that we do a rebuild or we regenerate these files, it's going to wipe out all these annotation changes that I just made. Um, previously, what we've done to solve this is just move that file outside of our generated uh, our generated folder into our Java source folder and then just sort of taking control of it ourselves. But for this POJO, we don't want to do that, right? We want we want our OAS to be our source of truth. And so we want to make it so that if we add a change to this OAS file, that change is reflected inside of our schema and our model object here. So rather than moving this out, what we're gonna do is we're gonna add some custom annotations and some custom properties to um, our OAS file that we can use to add our custom annotations to our POJO here. So the first thing that we need to do is download our template file. The way that we're going to do that is we're going to go on to GitHub. We're going to go to the OpenAPI Tools OpenAPI Generator. 
From there, we're going to go into Modules, Open API Generator, Source, Main, Resources. Here, you're going to see all of the different Open API generators. Quick note, the name of the generator may not match up with the name of the folder directly, but they should all be here. Um, a good example of that is our spring generator is actually called Java Spring here. So inside of here, you're going to see a bunch of .mustache files. Uh, mustache is the templating language used by OpenAPI Generator. It originally was an HTTP templating language, um, but this is going to be all the different files that are used to generate all those files that you see uh, created by OpenAPI Generator. And note, inside of libraries, you can see the, the specific libraries for us. Spring Boot would have a couple of the Spring Boot specific files, such as the palm is different uh, between the, the different Spring projects. Now, the file that we care about is our pojo file. So we're going to go down here to our pojo.mustache, and we're just going to grab the contents of that file. You can also just download it directly if you prefer. And inside of our project, in the base project directory, we're going to create a new folder. We're going to call it templates. And inside of that folder, um, I'm going to create a new file called pojo.mustache. Again, you can just copy and paste it. Make sure that it has the same name as the file you want to override. And then paste it in here. Also note that if you would prefer, you could just um, clone the entire repository and then just grab all of the template files and paste those into your templates directory and then you would just have full control over all templates. So now that we've downloaded our pojo mustache file and we have it in our project, the next thing we need to do is let OpenAPI know that hey we want to use anything inside of this templates directory to override whatever the default templates are. Uh, if you're generating your code with uh, the command line, there's the dash T flag that you can use. For us, we are using um, this OpenAPI generator Maven plugin. So for us, we're going to come into the configuration of this plugin and we are going to add a new configuration called template directory. And that's just going to point to our templates folder and basically anything inside of that templates folder, again, will just override whatever the default templates are. So you can just keep adding to this template folder if you want to override a different template later on. Now, our original goal here was to add class level and a field level annotation. So let's start off with the class level annotation. We can see the public class here. So I think we're going to want to add our annotation just above the public class. The first thing we're going to do is double squigglies, and this is just a way to denote a, a variable inside of mustache templating. I mean, you can see it all around. Uh, just a quick background, the way that, um, that OpenAPI generator works is it takes your OAS file and it breaks it down into like a fairly large JSON file with a bunch of variables in it. And then all of these squiggly brackets here are just variables inside of that JSON that, that the template files reference. Uh, now for custom, um, for custom properties inside of our open API specification files, it actually stores those under something called vendor extensions. So any custom, um, property that you want to add, you're going to need to have this vendor's extensions to reference. And then dot, and generally custom properties should begin with x dash. Um, and then from there, you can just name it whatever you want. So for us, we're going to name ours Java dash class dash annotations. Uh, so if if our uh, Java class annotations was just a single string, this would actually be good enough and it would work, um, but we're gonna make it an array in case we wanna add more annotations later on. And so the way that we can do that is we're gonna add a pound here. So in mustache templating, pound actually means selection, which can mean slightly different things depending on the variable type. For an array, it's essentially the start of an array. 
So if we do this, and then the way you end a selection is with a slash, this is basically, we're gonna iterate over all of our X Java class annotations. And for each one of them, all we wanna do is output whatever we have for that value of the array. And that's what dot does. Uh, you'll notice the triple curly brackets. The reason that there's three uh, is because by default, mustache URL encodes all of the, the strings that it outputs, uh, and we don't want that. It does that because it used to be an HTML uh, templating language. And then the last thing that we want to do here is what's called an inverse selection. So it's the same as what we did above, only we're going to have this caret. And then it's going to be the same vendor extensions. So what this says, it's also going to be ended by a slash here. What this says is, is basically if X Java class annotations doesn't exist or is empty for whatever reason, do whatever is in between these two things. So for us, we're just going to add a little to do reminder that says X Java class annotations are required. So just a little reminder for us since this particular annotation is required. Um, finally, we just need to add the field annotations for this guy. So we're going to just copy this piece here and try and find our field. And that is right here. So you can see up here where we're looping through all the bars. And I, I think the easiest way to find it, uh, at least I find, is to look for, for something inside of your Pojo. So uh, so here, let's look for the, the JSON property and we'll put it right above that. And you can see the JSON property is right here. So we're gonna put our annotation just above JSON. Uh, and so this is gonna be the same thing. We're not gonna do the inverse on this one because um, these annotations aren't required. And in fact, some of, our, some of our fields won't have annotations on them, but we'll rename it to XJava field annotation. And at this point, our template should be good to go. And all we need to do, all we have got left is to add our custom properties to our OAS file. Now let's validate that everything works before we make that leap. So we're just gonna come here and we're gonna regenerate our sources. And this should go fairly quickly. Okay, and we're gonna come back. We're gonna check our to-do. Um, make sure we have the newest one open. Um, oh, we forgot to save our palm.xml. Okay, we'll just do this through VS Code. Take a look at our to-do, and hopefully, yeah, here we go. Uh, you can see that our new comment popped up, our little reminder comment. So the last thing that we need to do now then is add our custom annotations. So we're gonna go here. Uh, the first class level annotation, we're gonna wanna add to the schema item itself. So here we're gonna add X Java class annotation. And this is gonna be an array. And so what we wanna add here is our at entity class. Um, now note that when I did that, it automatically imported this guy up here. Uh, doing imports is, is a little beyond what we're gonna do in this particular video. So in order to make this work, we're actually gonna need to import the fully qualified class name for all of our annotations here. Uh, it also just generally makes it a little easier. So inside of here, we're just gonna import our Java X persistence entity. Great. Uh, the other thing that we wanted to import was the ID and the generated value. And so I find the easiest way to do that is we're just gonna come here at ID, and then at generated value. Um, and then here we wanted to use the strategy 
identity. We're just going to copy these two guys. Uh, we're going to make our new X Java field annotations. Um, so yeah. Uh, oh, also we need the fully qualified class names here. So just throw that on each of these guys. And we should be good to go. So let's do, um, let's regenerate our sources one more time. Uh, we'll validate that our to-do has our new annotations. There are no errors. And at this point, we should be able to actually build our application. Okay, our application is built. And then if we go to localhost 8080 Swagger, we can see that at this point, we are actually returning, um, here we go. We're actually returning some of that data that we inserted in the uh, data.sql file. And we can even create our own. Get a 201, which is good. And then our new entry pops up here. So everything seems to work as expected. At this point, uh, we were able to take uh, our existing Spring Boot application and use templating to modify some of our POJOs to include JPA annotations, so to include our own custom annotations. Obviously, this could easily be expanded uh, to include logging if that was something that you wanted to add through templating or, you know, wh whatever custom annotations you want anywhere else. Um, you could modify how classes are named, that sort of thing. Uh, templating is a pretty powerful tool. And if you want to learn more about things that you can do with templating, uh, if you go to the openapigenerator.tech website and click customization, it actually talks not only about templating, but actually creating your own custom generator if the generators that exist are not currently um, sufficient for what your use case are. This one's fairly involved. Uh, using templating talks a little bit more about templating. One thing I want to mention that's actually uh, fairly useful is you can add templates to your class path, which is, uh, I think, maybe a better approach if you are, especially if you're uh, trying to create templates that you want to use across multiple projects. Uh, I hope this was useful. In our next set of videos, we're going to be looking still at some more stuff with uh, OpenAPI. I think our next video specifically is going to look at Schema Thesis, which is a testing suite that's used to validate that the status codes that you have in your OAS document match the status codes that are returned by your endpoints. Um, so we're going to hold you accountable for that. But I hope that, that this made templating a little bit more clearer. Um, thanks.